sit back, relax, and take a ride with us on the Gun Blog Variety Cast, episode 17. <laughs> I'm your host, Sean, from NC Gun Blog, and with me today is Adam from Guns, Cars, Tech Blog. How are you doing, Adam? I'm tired again. Oh, no. <laughs> the baby slept <laughs> through the night like two nights in a row, and we were all excited, and he was up at like 12.50 and 4.50 this morning. Oh. So, yeah. It's going to be like that for a while. Yeah, I understand. It's temporary. It only lasts two or three years. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to start with a tactical dog and fitness report. 31.3 dog walking miles, and I am so amazed at these catches my dog is making. All four feet coming off the ground, snatching the frisbee out of the air. She's just... She's loving oh, it. Oh, wow. That's cool. I, I, wow. Is she bringing it back to you? Oh, yeah. Especially when I've got two frisbees, and she especially likes it when I let her just drop it at my feet rather than actually hand it to me. But my wife prefers the frisbee handed directly to her, so I have to make her watch me and you know give me the frisbee mine or gotcha. drop it she prefers drop it because that means she can run past me after the other frisbee right we do both though that way she's listening and and doing what we want rather than running on a self-program good plan good plan so uh me i'm doing the couch to 5k again i'm on week four <laughs> again again i think we've had this conversation before and we're only yeah. on episode 17 so yeah i get i usually get to about week six and then i get sick this time i got to week six and then i had a baby <laughs> so well, that's kind of so right? yeah that's kind of yeah um so I, I started up uh you know about a month ago and um yeah so so that's that's where i'm going um dog has a weigh-in on saturday tactical dog mm -hmm. um i'm i'm hopeful that the extra long walks and the reduced food that's been going on for the last three months has had some effect i don't know we'll see Yeah, my dog lost two pounds oh <sighs> she got sick some kind of bacteria that dogs Apparently I'll have anyway, but she had way more than she needs. And so she's on uh, some sort of an antibiotic to knock it down a bit. And, you know, so she lost a couple of pounds. <laughs> Great. And you're trying to keep her weight up. Yeah. I'm trying to keep mine down. Yeah. Ha. <sighs> and now it's time for that bratty kid sister of the gun blogosphere, Aaron. Aaron wants to talk about prepping for people who have animals. All right, Aaron, what do you got for us today? Last week, I talked about prepping for an evacuation with a baby. So today, I'm going to talk about evacuating with dogs and cats. So, Sean, Adam, I know that you both have tactical dogs. So what kind of preps do you have in place in case you have to evacuate? Well, I got a bag with some food in it, and I, you know, I know where the leash is. That, that's probably a little bit better than me. My dog food is in a giant crate. All right, well, that's why I'm here then. Prepping for a disaster where you stay at home, also known as bugging in, is pretty straightforward. You just make sure you have enough food, water, medicine for your pets to last however long you plan to stay at home, whether it's 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. But for evacuating, also known as bugging out, there are some specific concerns to address with your pets. So, food. The good news is that Mammals like cats and dogs, they have it pretty easy in this department as they can eat human food just as long as you don't feed them things that are toxic to them, like chocolate, anything with caffeine, grapes, onions. onions, yes. There's a lot of things that you can't feed your pets. But in general, you can feed them your meat and your potatoes. It's not really great for them over the long run, but for an evacuation, they can eat what you eat. Tactical Dog loves French fries. Ah. Uh. Yeah, and it's kind of funny. My dog doesn't, won't even touch him. I give him some french fries, out it goes. Just be aware that if you are feeding your pet from your food, that, well, that's going to deplete your food supply, so make sure that you have enough. If you've got a small little purse dog, that's not a problem. If you've got, like, a St. Bernard, you've got a problem. Okay, water. Good news, you don't have to carry special pet water. Bad news, pets drink a lot of water. Uh, according to the Merck Veterinary Manual, they require about 50 milliliters of water per kilogram of body weight. Sean, I know that you hate metric. Yes. 
I, I didn't feel like doing the conversion. Oh, I got a smartphone. It can do it for me. <laughs> okay, but here's the worst news. If your pet eats dry food, you know, kibble, they require two to three times more water just to help them digest the dry, um, sometimes salty kibble. So if your cat eats half a cup of dry food, she's going to need one and a half cups of water as well. And of course, the hotter the weather, the more your pet is going to drink. So you may end up requiring a lot of water. So I refer everyone to episode 12 where I talked about filtering on the go so you don't have to bring it with you. And of course, it's a good idea to have a water bowl so that your pet can drink from it. Now, if your pet is small enough to fit in a crate, that's good. You can put supplies in the crate or on it, and your pet will be secure inside. You've got the drawback, though, that crates are heavy and awkward. If your pet is large, you have to make doubly sure that you have a leash or other pet restraint item with your preps. On the upside, if you've got a large enough dog, he might be able to carry items for you in little doggy saddlebags. Now, be warned that there are... Lots of hotels, and I think just about any first aid or FEMA shelter, they won't allow pets that aren't certified service animals. So if you plan on bugging out with your animals, you need to either prepare to camp out or put your pet someplace safe. So make sure you have a list of boarding kennels, pet hospitals, or friends who are willing to board your pet handy. For health, make sure that you pack plenty of poo bags or bring along a portable litter box for your cats. Make sure that they've got their comfort items, like their bed, a security blanket, a squeaky toy, something to keep them happy. It's important to know how to perform first aid for your pet and have items in your kit that'll keep them from licking at their wounds. There's an item I like, it's called EMT gel, which I used on myself when I accidentally stabbed myself in the thigh with a knife. Did that keep you from licking the wound? That wasn't a problem, but the point is... <laughs> It works on humans, too, because, you know, it's for use on animals, and humans are animals. I'll, I'll talk about it in a later podcast. I really like it. Finally, you want to make sure that your pet stays with you, so pack extra collars and leashes just in case. Microchip your pet so that if you get separated, you have a greater chance of being reunited with them. And like I mentioned with the uh, scan your stuff, have pictures of your pets on your smartphone or your tablet. Make sure their licenses are paid and their shots are up to date, and you have a copy of those in your documents. All right, Aaron. That's some really good information. Thanks very much, and see you next week. See you next week, guys. If you'd like to read more from Aaron, check out her blog, lurkingrhythmically.blogspot.com. Felons behaving badly. Pembroke man arrested, charged in triple murder. Dateline, Lumberton, North Carolina. A Pembroke man has been charged with three counts of murder for the shooting deaths of three men in the woods in Maxton last weekend, according to Robeson County Sheriff Kenneth Seeley. Suspect 22 of Casey Road was arrested at Robeson County Sheriff's Office and charged with three counts of first-degree murder on Friday afternoon, Seeley said. Suspect is accused of shooting and killing victim number 1, 43, victim 2, 34, and victim 3, 35. There was no information available on potential motive for the murders. According to the sheriff's office, the men were shot in the woods in a swamp behind a home on the 2500 block of McLeod Drive. Come by and say hi. On the night of November 30th, which was a Sunday. When deputies arrived at the scene of the murder, a concrete picnic area in the woods, two of the men were dead and the third was critically injured. The third man later died at Scotland Memorial Hospital in Laurenburg. Major Anthony Thompson, chief of detectives, said a family member of one of the men had called 911. Victim 1 lived on Fremont Road in Maxton, Victim 2 on Rose Road in Maxton, and Victim 3 on Hazel Road in Pembroke. That sounds kind of a, like a hairy situation. So suspect number 1, robbery, Interstate Compact, South Carolina. So this guy committed a robbery in South Carolina for which he was convicted, and he is on probation in North Carolina on the Interstate Compact. Just because you committed a crime in one state doesn't mean you have to stay in that state until your probation is finished. You can work a deal where the state you want to live in or you do live in uh, will handle the probation for you. Hmm. Victim number one, assault with a deadly weapon, inflicting serious injury, class H felon, January 1991, operating without a license, 1992, DWI, same day, 1992, larceny, December 97, misdemeanor, class one, and larceny after B&E, felony B&E, both felon class H, 528 2001. 
Victim number two. Possessed with intent to sell. Schedule two. 12-27-2005. And possessed with intent to sell. Schedule six. 12-27-2005. Both felony class H. Victim number three. Larceny. Misdemeanor class one. 3-2-2004. Now, looking at this, what strikes me is, you know, after having done 16 weeks of this, and this is week 17, these don't actually seem like really bad guys with their <laughs> with their small felony records. Yeah. You know, I mean, usually we get, you know, there there's, you know, a guy rap sh- with a rap sheet, you know, 6 feet long, but you know, you've got you've got one guy that was in trouble 10 years ago and that was it. Yeah, with a misdemeanor. Yeah, and then you've got one guy uh who had, you know, some drugs on him 10 years ago, 9 years ago. No, no, possession with intent to sell. Oh, so that's he had what enough. Wits. Okay. He had enough so that it was a okay. serious offense. It was a felony, not a not a misdemeanor. Well, but still, after that, we, there there was nothing, right? Well, no mm-hmm. convictions. We don't know about right. arrests, right? Right. And then the oldest guy looks like he was in trouble three or four times, and the last time he was in trouble was in two thousand and one. Yep. So you know, this is kind of not typical of what we see, but the point still stands. Felon seeking bullets. Yes. I would like to point out to you that in just 16 weeks, we've gone from, oh my goodness, the man has a felony to, oh, well, you know, it's not too (laughs) many felonies. Right. That's what I'm really getting at with this is that it just is a drumbeat of, oh my goodness, what sort of people do we have running about in our society? Well, let's talk with Nikki Kenyon about foreign policy for grownups. Nikki talks about foreign aid to Israel. Well, hey, Nikki. It looks like today, not only are we joined by my dog, Dysis, we're joined with your cat, Indy, the eight-month-old kitten. So if people hear that squealing, we know why. Yep, he's brand new and he's still exploring the house, and I figured it was better than having him scratch at the door, so. All right, Nikki. The U.S. hands out a lot of foreign aid. I'm generally against handing out money to other countries. Where does it go and who gets it? Well, there's different types of foreign aid. Um, USAID hands out a whole lot of foreign aid to various countries that are considered in need or developing. State Department hands out a whole lot of aid, but the single biggest recipient of foreign military financing, or FMF as we like to call it, is in fact Israel. And this is something that libertarian types consistently rail about. And if you oppose it, you're considered anti-Semitic for it. You're castigated. You're a neo-Nazi. You're this, that, and the other. But in fact, so Israel is the largest cumulative recipient of U.S. foreign assistance since World War II. We know this. To date, the United States has provided Israel with $121 billion in non-inflation adjusted dollars um, in bilateral assistance. And most of it comes in the form of FMF. Israel receives benefits, also special benefits that are not available to any other countries. Uh, For example, Israel can use some U.S. military assistance both for research and development in the United States and for military purchases from Israeli manufacturers as well. Um, In addition, the U.S. assistance that's earmarked for Israel is generally given to Israel during the first 30 days of the fiscal year instead of kind of gradually spacing it out and you know, if something happens, like let's say we don't pass a budget, oops, nobody gets anything, Israel gets theirs no matter what. So they've got a lot of perks. In 2014, in fiscal 2014, Israel received $3 billion in FMF, as well as additional millions in funding for R&D and maintenance of various weapons systems. In 2015, the administration received has requested the same amount in FMF, so 3.1-ish billion dollars, plus 10 million dollars in migration and refugee assistance. Um, the Missile Defense Agency has a budget for Israel for fiscal 15. Their request is about 97-ish million. Um, the administration is also requesting almost 176 million for Israel's Iron Dome. So that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money to throw at one country. What are our justifications for that? There are several justifications for it. Israel is, in fact, a steadfast military ally. 
So strategically, it's smart to have one good ally in a sea of ones that we just may not trust. It's the one free state in a sea of Arab authoritarian states in the region. They provide us with vital intelligence. They are geographically close to our adversaries in the region, so they provide info. And they're really in a position to deploy faster should... Uh, you know, the the stuff hit the oscillating blades, so to speak. So we as a society also love the underdog. So this tiny little country filled with people who have been abused and victimized throughout history, during the Holocaust and, and beyond that, it's surrounded by enemies who have attacked it from its very inception as a nation. So we as a nation tend to be very sensitive and very sympathetic toward Israel. And Honestly, for the most selfish of reasons as well, politicians love Israel because voters love Israel. To aid Israel is politically popular. They've got a huge lobby, and if you are considered anti-Israel, chances are you're not going to get elected. Well, that's the arguments for. What are the arguments against? A lot of people say that Israel systematically violates the human rights of Palestinians in the occupied territories. And because opponents claim that it violates said human rights, they say the U.S. aid violates U.S. law because Congress passed laws that prohibit the president from furnishing military aid or selling weapons to any country that consistently violates internationally recognized human rights standards or uses weapons as an offensive rather than a defensive kind of measure. So they claim that Israel is is a human rights violator. They claim it's an exclusionary state. Um, You know, they say the Israeli law of return allows Jews from all over the world to immigrate to Israel and gain citizenship there. But Palestinian refugees who were forced to flee their homes in 1948 and 1967 are excluded from returning to their homes and their towns of origin. Never mind, Israel is the only nation in the Middle East that actually gives Palestinians the right to vote, and there are Arabs in the Knesset, in their parliament. Never mind all that. Israel is bad, and therefore we must not give it money. And additionally, it's, it's also what you said. Why are we giving out money to foreign nations who are perfectly capable of defending themselves, of taking care of themselves, when we've got needs at home? We've got a huge debt. We've, we've got people who are on food stamps and homeless. And we've got a lot of charity that needs to be taken care of at home. So really, why Israel? The bottom line is, I think, It's a complicated issue. Uh, We have to balance strategic interests with human rights interests. But the other thing is, just because you oppose foreign aid, specifically to Israel, it doesn't make you an anti-Semite. It doesn't mean you hate Jews. It doesn't mean you want Jews to die at the hands of the Arabs that surround them. It simply means that you want Israel to stand on its own feet and you want the money that we earn, your tax money, to actually be spent on on something domestic, on something that actually benefits you. And many will argue that helping Israel and helping all these other nations really doesn't benefit us at all. All right, Nikki and Indy. And Indy. good to talk to you. (laughs) See you next week. You bet. Take care. Well, Nikki blogs at thelibertyzone.com. Strange laws. So this week, we're just going to talk about another kind of concept. Uh, malum prohibitum versus malum in se. Now those, that's Latin. Wait, 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 wait. I was told there would be no math. Well, <laughs> surprise. Uh, so uh, those are two Latin terms. Uh, and just to kind of break it down, malum prohibitum is it's bad because we say it's bad. Uh, and malum in se is it's just naturally bad. Can you give me an example? I can. So rape. Like, everybody knows that's just bad, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's malum in se. Right. You really don't have to discuss whether we should make a law against that. Right. It's just bad. Right. Not putting the proper stickers on a box of orchids, that's malum prohibitum. But the sign on the side of the road that says how fast I can go. So that's also 
malum prohibitum. And the fact that I drive on the right and not on the left. That's malum prohibitum. And the fact that I don't run over little kids going through school zones. That's malum in se. Okay. Why are these distinctions important? Well, when you're making laws, it's like I said a couple of weeks ago, and you know I, I beat this drum pretty heavily, you shouldn't make something illegal that you wouldn't shoot your own grandmother to stop her from doing, right? Okay. So, because that's where everything ends. It all ends in puppy killing SWAT teams. It does. If you want to go 70 and a 35, they're eventually going to shoot you if you keep continuing to go 70 and a 35 and you don't stop and pull over when you're supposed to and and all that good stuff. Right. You're going to have to work up to it. They're not just going to shoot you as you go by at 70 miles an hour. Right. Right. But But eventually, if you keep refusing to comply, you are going to get shot. Yes. And we have a really, really good example of that that everybody's gotten majorly outraged about up in uh, New York City. Right. Right. So there was a guy who was selling cigarettes one at a time. Mm -hmm. And that is illegal in the in the city of New York. And it's also illegal under federal law. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, it is. And when they went to arrest him for doing that, he was like, wait, 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 no, no, no. And they, uh, they, yes, he was resisting by saying, hey, wait, no, please don't arrest me. But they immediately then took him down and he died as a result of the arrest. Right. And if you listen to the Law of Self-Defense podcast, you will hear a very good explanation of why it wasn't a crime for the police officers to do what they did. It makes perfect sense that they don't charge these police officers because they didn't use excessive force. The fact that somebody dies from something doesn't necessarily make it deadly force. What really outrages everybody is not that they used force. What outrages everybody is that that was such a stupid thing for somebody to die over. Yes. yes. It's a malum prohibitum law. It wasn't worth a puppy killing SWAT team do we really want to prohibit so many things that dude ends up dead because he resists arrest for selling cigarettes on the street? And my answer is no. No. I mean, personally, I don't care. He can sell whatever he wants. Right. He could sell his own body if he could get somebody to buy it. That doesn't bother me. We need to be very clear about what we're pissed off about on this. It's not that he died as a result of being arrested. It's what he was arrested for. He was arrested for something really stupid. You know, something that stupid should never lead to somebody's death. Absolutely. And we need to be very careful. There ought to be a law. Didn't you cover this? I did. This I is did. one of those things this that grinds your gears. Yes. Yes. There ought to be a law. Yeah. There ought to be a law that ends up with some dude dead on the sidewalk. And I put this in on Facebook. The police didn't kill him. You killed him. I killed him. We killed him. We made something illegal and the police enforced that law and he died because of it. We did it. We bear the responsibility. Well, Miguel's on assignment, and he'll return next week. But in his place, we got a special guest, Ben Barry, of the Triangle Tactical Podcast, to talk to us about why you should shoot competition. Well, we're joined today by a special guest, Ben Barry of the Triangle Tactical Podcast. How are you doing, Ben? I'm doing great. Ben shoots IDPA, USPSA, and is the stage designer for a local shooting match here in Wake County, North Carolina. Ben is teaching me some dry fire exercises to help me in my quest for sharpshooter. So Ben, why should our listeners shoot competition? Well, I think the the first reason is, and this is counter to a lot of people outside the sport, it's just that it's it's not scary. It's not exclusionary. You know, whenever whenever we talk to people, they say, oh, well, I'm not ready. You know, I don't want people to laugh at me when I show up with, you know, whatever. And it, it just, it isn't like that. I mean, you came and shot a match with us a couple weeks ago, and you were carrying your gun just like you carry it, and the holster you carry it with your mags and everything, and everybody was like, cool. Yeah, I've never had any real trouble no matter what match I went to. I did shoot a few matches in Pennsylvania, USPSA. It was exactly the same thing. Yeah, and so, you know, there's there's never a better time to start than now. The, The second reason to really get out and just start shooting matches is it'll give you an experience that you really can't get anywhere else except like a gunfight on the streets, which obviously we don't encourage. And that's a little bit of chance to practice under stress and get what we call buzzer brain. You know, when that first timing start buzzer goes off and your plan and everything just goes poof and disappears, and it, it helps you to, to work through that and, and, and keep your wits about you when you're under stress and you need to make fast and accurate shots. Yeah, I've, uh, I've had that happen. Uh, you've seen that happen. We've got pretty good video of that happening. When something didn't work the way I thought it was going to work, and I'm sitting there going, 
uh, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? And I and I I don't recall if anybody said just shoot the target, but that was pretty much what ha- ended up happening. Yeah, it, it helped speed up that that diagnostic and uh, remediation loop. It's actually one of the one of the problems that competition shooters have is we'll have you know a gun jam and we'll just clear it and not worry about it, and then later on it's like, well, you know what happened? Oh, did you have a failure to eject or whatever? It's like I don't know, but I fixed it. It's done with. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yep. You don't you don't want to stop in the middle of a gunfight and go, huh? Oh, that's interesting. It's second second double feed this week. <laughs> so so another reason to come out and start shooting is it puts you in a situation where you get regular feedback on your shooting. You know, you don't just necessarily go to the range whenever you want to and, you know, just put up a, the same target you always put up and shoot it the same way you always shoot it and get about the same group you always get. It gets you on a schedule. So, you, you know, you show up on Saturday and, you know, whether, whether you feel ready to shoot or not, sometimes, you know, that's when the match is. So you show up and whether you feel like you've been practicing, you show up and you shoot and you see, was that good? Was it bad? You know, you can see yourself improving. You can see when you're not shooting well, when you are shooting well. And it just, it, it helps you get a sense of, of how you're doing. Yeah, I've noticed that if, if all I do is go down and, and shoot slow fire at a bullseye, I'm really good at that. But that's not really a useful skill unless you happen to want to shoot competition bullseye. Well, it's an excellent foundation, but it's certainly, it's certainly not a, a, a comprehensive defensive skill. No, no. It's, ha- it's helpful to shoot accurately, but uh, if you can't shoot accurately and quickly then, you know, you've kind of defeated the purpose. Yeah, it's, it's definitely all a balance. And, uh, you know, ultimately, competition will make you better. Just showing up and shooting more, getting more trigger time, seeing other people on the range, talking to them about how they shoot, maybe even asking your buddy at the match to say, hey, can you show me some drills to drive fire? You know, that kind of stuff. And when did that happen? Oh, yeah. yeah once or twice. One of the things that Moss Ayub says when he was discussing in the early days of his studying gunfights. He said that he had a chat with various different police chiefs about, well, what police officers survive their gunfights? What police officers end the gunfight quickly and in their own favor? And what he found was is they were the competition shooters that the police had. They, they've had competition shooting for police for a long time. And those competition shooters, when they got into a gunfight, they won. They won decisively and they won quickly. And that sounds pretty much like what I want. I can only speculate here, but what I imagine those cops are probably shooting is a, a variant of competition called PPC, where you're just basically standing on a fixed firing line at, you know, from like five to 20 yards and the target turns to face you and you have, you know, five seconds to shoot five rounds on it. So it's not even, you know, any of the high zoo, you know, move around, run and gun, duck around cover stuff. It's just a little bit of time pressure that's graded on accuracy. And even that just got them to the point where they could just on demand deliver the shot under time pressure. Mm -hmm. That's what you need. So finally, you should start shooting competition because it's just so much freaking fun. Yeah, that should be number one. Right. I mean, you know, it's one of these things I didn't, I didn't set out, you know, a couple of years ago when I got into it to, to end up, you know, hosting a competition shooting podcast and be in my garage three times a week, dry firing and helping to run a match and all this, but you just, you just get more involved and, and the more you do it, the more fun it is. I haven't figured out how to, how to, how to back off yet. And it's just, man, it's too good. Yeah, it is a lot of fun. That is the number one reason that everybody should be out there taking, doing competition is because you're going to have a good time. I mean, you're going to be around the people that do the same thing you do. Gun people are all good people and you're using your gun. You're getting better at it. You're, you're, building skills for the future, but you're just having a great time while you do it. Couldn't have said it better. Well, so get out to your local match. IDPA, USPSA, hey, cowboy action, I don't care. Get out there and have some fun. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for having me. If you're not already listening to it, you should check out Ben and Luke on the Triangle Tactical podcast at triangletactical.net. Triangle Tactical is also available on iTunes and Stitcher. So I really like that segment. Um, it really uh, kind of struck a chord with me, particularly when you mentioned that, you know, when you go to the range, you can hit bullseyes all, all the time, right? Yeah. So I started doing competition about three years ago uh, after I took a uh, NRA certified pistol instructor class. And during one of the, the strings of fire, you know, we did like 10 rounds downrange and I looked and all of my 10 rounds were in, you know, about a three by five index card, right? And we were at about 10 yards. And 
there were probably 25 other students in that class, and they were all law enforcement or military. I was the only true civilian in that class. Now look around, everybody else is in about an eight inch circle for those 10. <laughs> and I went, okay, all right. So one of these things is not like the other. I'm the only non-professional shooter here. Clearly, I am not doing something right. And I started thinking about it and I was like, oh, they're doing it much faster than me. That's what's going on here. So that was actually the impetus for me to go and start doing competition. And it's great. I love it. Uh, I'm a much better shooter now. Now I don't care that, you know, I can, you know, shoot 15 rounds into a, the size of a quarter at 10 yards. That is much less a deal to me than can I get everything in an eight inch A zone uh, in, you know, less than five seconds. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely wonderful to see first time shooters come out there. We had a guy who was 16 years old come out a couple of weeks ago and he was fantastic. He said it was his first competition, but I don't actually believe him. <laughs> we also have uh, these uh, two guys. They're 18 year old twins. They're like six foot six. I asked them if they were the brute squad and they looked at me like I had two heads. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't seen that movie? Uh, no, no. Oh uh, yeah, I'm the brute squad. Right, right. If you're if you're under 30, you probably haven't seen the movie. Uh, yeah, and we're not going to explain it to you. Right, just right. figure Go it out. Go watch. Yeah. Yeah, just figure it out. The one thing I, I will say, though, is that a lot of times you'll have police officers that come into competition and they think that they're going to outshoot everybody. And I used to make a joke when uh, when I first started. I love it when police officers come to competition because I know that means I'm not going to come in last. Yeah. So the problem is that they would come in and there was two or three guys that, that this happened to. They would come in and they would shoot and they would do very, very poorly. And then we'd never see them again because they were embarrassed. Yeah. But that's not the lesson that, that you should take. If you come in last, that just means you have room for improvement. That doesn't mean that, that you should be embarrassed. You know, it doesn't mean that you're a really bad shooter. The fact that you showed up to competition means that you're probably better than 90% of people who own a pistol in the first place. That's true. If I could do one thing with the uh, police officers in my town, it would be to force them to go to an IDPA match once a month. Because then I would be guaranteed that they would improve the standard of shooting. Because you know what? If I pick up the phone and I call for help, they're the ones that are going to come. I want them to be really good with their Yes. Gun. I want them to hit what I want them to shoot. Absolutely. You know, I would much rather they shoot the person that's causing me trouble than me have to do it. And I want them to hit them and not me. Yes. So if you're a police officer, go to competition. Yeah. Fun with headlines. And uh, I'll just go ahead and, you know, read you the headline. I'll let you think about it for a minute. And then I'll read the article. Former state trooper dies during incident in DeKalb County. All right, here we go. Here's the article. A former state trooper died following an altercation with his wife's ex-husband. Officials said former trooper, suspect, there's your first indication, forced his way into his father-in-law's home on Steeplechase Drive in Smithville Sunday evening. Stop by, say hi. Once inside, he got in a fight with victim who was dropping off his children to his ex-wife, who is now married to suspect. Oh, this is going sideways really fast. Yeah. What you've got here is the first husband dropping off the kids with the second husband at the father-in-law's house. Nothing good is going to come no. to this. I know it. No. So during the fight, suspect shot victim once in the arm. Suspect then apparently turned the gun on himself. He died at the scene. Victim was treated for non-life-threatening injuries. An investigation in the incident remains ongoing. Suspect had apparently shown up at the home about an hour before the incident and gotten into a verbal argument with his wife. Officers were called and made suspect leave the home at the time. Okay, so let me see if I got this straight. Mm -hmm. Wife yes. is at her daddy's house. Yes. Her current husband goes and gets in a fight with her yes. at daddy's house. They call the cops and throw him out. Yes. Here comes old husband mm -hmm. with kids mm -hmm. to drop off mm -hmm. at wife's daddy's house. Right. Current husband shows up after having been thrown out earlier. By the police. By the police and gets into a fight with old husband, shoots him, shoots himself. Yeah. And this is categorized as an incident. This is categorized as former state trooper dies during incident in DeKalb County. Can we say very neutral language? <laughs> would it be an incident if you did something like that? Uh, no, it would be attempted murder-suicide by crazy gun nut. Yeah, by crazy gun nut. That's exactly what that would be. Okay, incident. <sighs> and they say that there's no editorializing in straight news. Yeah. 
Well, after mocking the security of our current credit cards, Baron wants to talk about the development of better, more secure credit cards in Tech Tips with the Baron. Baron, we talked about how the U.S. lags behind Europe in credit card technology. What options are we looking at going forward from the simple mag strip on a plastic card that we have now? Well, there's actually a couple different options. First and foremost, we're actually starting to see digital wallets come about, which is near-field communication. So your phone itself acts as your wallet, and you use a middleman service such as Google Wallet or Amazon to actually authenticate you in the transaction. The other thing that I've actually heard kicked around other than chip and pen lately is much like chip and pen, but it uses RSA time shared secret information so that like Google Authenticator will constantly change its pen every 30 seconds. Your card can do the same exact thing if both sides know the same secret. Those are two options. The benefit of the RSA is that if somebody was to catch the pen, well, the pen's going to constantly change, and unless they know the shared secret, they can't go and reverse engineer what the next pen is going to be. You found a funny story about how a couple of petty thieves were exploiting the credit card validation system. Oh, yes. So, a couple thieves, meth addicts really, they figured out that if they coat the satellite dish of a couple of their local convenience stores, that the credit card system was no longer able to authenticate. And interestingly enough, when the credit card system can't authenticate, it defaults to an accept. So you can show up with a fraudulent credit card, and as long as the system is down, the system is going to accept the credit card transaction and assume that it's valid. Can someone please explain to me, if you can't validate the card, why in the name of God are you accepting it? <laughs> That's a good question. You said once that the retailers are waiting for the banks to upgrade, and the banks are waiting for the retailers to upgrade, and in the meantime, nothing's getting upgraded. What's going to push the technology forward? It's honestly a vicious circle. So currently, we all remember the Target breach and the Home Depot breach. Oh, yeah. Uh, I was a victim of the Home Depot breach. You were a victim of the Home Depot breach. And what's happening is there's actually now some lawsuits moving forward from the banks against the retailers. The banks are saying that the retailers weren't doing enough to secure their systems and prevent theft of the data. At the same time, I can look at the retailers and go, you know, if you want to call me up and have me come testify in court, there are plenty of things that the banks could be doing to help secure their data and prevent this type of thing from happening. Most importantly, and that is forcing the retailers to actually move forward. The banks could actually go tell the retailers, hey guys, if you want to continue having the business from our customers, you are going to upgrade your point of sale system to support chip and pen. If you don't, our customers won't be able to shop here. Yeah, I was thinking about it. When I received my new credit card after the, I think it was the Home Depot breach, but it might have been Target. Um, I got a new debit card from the uh, bank. And I thought, wow, if they had to send out a new debit card to every single one of their bank customers that shopped at Target and Home Depot, that had to cost them a lot of money. It cost them in the millions of dollars. And so they're going to sue to recover some of that money? And they're suing to basically try and recover some of that money. And at the same time, I turn around and go, look, you issued this, you're reissuing the same crappy cards that landed you this in this nightmare to begin with. Why not just start actually upgrading and force the issue? That's a difficult question. I don't understand why they're not moving forward with better technology. It's a finger-pointing game. It's their fault. It's their fault. And no one wants to spend the money because that what they're really trying to do, and it's the classic business mistake, they're looking at the systems that they currently have as quote-unquote capital investments. And the longer that they can continually use those without actually upgrading, the wider the profit margin ends up being on them. Until you start factoring in the theft losses. Q and I understand this, but I'm really wondering whether or not business majors can understand this. <laughs> All right, Baron. It's good to talk to you. See you again next week. See you next week, Sean. Baron still blogs at the-minuteman.org. So in Charlotte, we had an interesting uh, thing happen. Actually, it was in Concord, North Carolina. Good Samaritan killed by someone asking to use his phone. 
How many times have we seen something like this happen? Yeah. Pro tip. Uh, I know most of our listeners are pretty experienced with all this stuff, but if you're new, um, if somebody ever comes up to you and says, hey, can I have a dollar? Or, hey, can I borrow your cell phone? Or, hey, man, you got a cigarette. You're about to get robbed. Yeah. I believe this is called an interview. Yes. And your job yes. is to fail the interview. Yes. I don't make too many book recommendations. There's a book recommendation I think everybody should read. It's called Facing Violence, and it's by a guy named Rory Miller. One of the things that he says is, is predators don't recognize any distinction but predator versus prey. And your objective is to make him think that he's tying into a predator, not into a prey. So he's going to ask you some questions, or he's going to do something to convince you to tell him by your actions that you are an easy victim. So your job is to make it clear to him that you're not an easy victim. What's the easiest, simplest, shortest word you can use that convinces somebody that you're not an easy victim? Hey, can I have a dollar? No. Uh, can I use your cell phone? No. Uh, well, how about a cigarette? No. Well, you're no fun. Racist. Wait a second, but you're white. That's not how I self-identify. <laughs> A senseless shooting is under investigation in Concord. A man's wife drove the victim to the Concord Police Department on Cabarrus Avenue Wednesday afternoon. Police immediately went outside and found the victim in the passenger seat. Efforts to save him were unsuccessful. The man has been identified as 31-year-old Andres Truch. And I'm sorry if, I've messing, if I'm messing your name up. Police say the couple was stopped in their car on Malvern Drive at Lincoln Street on the way to the grocery store to prepare for a Thanksgiving dinner. A group of five men was walking down the street and flagged down the couple, asking to borrow a cell phone, Trouch's wife, Marie Monia, told police. Just as they asked for the phone, Monia says one of the men pulled open the passenger door and began demanding money at gunpoint. As she handed over the cash, it appeared the man was unsatisfied with the amount and pulled the trigger. Monia told police she was scared and she drove straight to the station, which was just over a mile away. Officers are looking for witnesses with more information. Trouch's wife was unharmed. He was a machine operator at SiteWorks, a construction company in Charlotte. Monier said he never missed a day of work and was a devoted family man. He was to turn 32 on Christmas Eve. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty bad. One thing I do want to point out here is uh, as she handed over the cash, it appeared the man was unsatisfied with the amount and pulled the trigger. A lot of people don't realize how common this actually is. So a lot of these strong-arm robbery guys view that as their job. So they know that if they go out and they rob five people, they're going to get $1,000. They go out one day and they're, I owe so-and-so some money, so I'm going to go and get that money, right? So they'll go out and they'll rob four people. They get $800. They get to the fifth person and they get $5. Well, they're really mad because they've taken this giant risk committing felony robbery. Mm -hmm. It's a big deal. And you don't have their money. That's their money because that's mm -hmm. their job. They treat it as a career. They put in their time. They do the work. They're supposed to get paid. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the money, that's your fault. That's right. Now, I'd like to point something else out. Her name is Maria Monier. His name was Andreas Truch. They're Hispanic. Hispanics are well known. Their stereotype is they don't deal with banks. They have money. They have cash. And on payday, who gets robbed? Hispanic people. Interesting. I didn't pick that up. That's a well-known tactic. If you want to make money to rob people, you know, why would you rob people who carry nothing but plastic? Robbing me is a waste of time. My wedding ring is worth $100 and I have three pieces of plastic in my wallet and no cash ever because I don't carry cash. So you're going to get plastic that if I am not dead is going to be worthless to you in 20 minutes. Robbing me is a waste of time. And, you know, fat middle-aged white guy, I can bother him. Let's go hit that uh, obviously hardworking Hispanic dude over there. You look at his look at his work boots. You can tell he's got a job. So mm -hmm. he's probably got cash in his pocket on Friday. I used to live in an apartment complex where I'm pretty sure that I was the only guy in the building that actually spoke English. Mm -hmm. And uh, and one day there was a guy that showed up at my front door. He made it very clear that he really wanted it in my in my apartment. Well, lucky for everybody in that, I failed that interview by answering the door with a uh, 45 in my hand. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, it's funny how quickly they go from, you have to let me in to, I don't want no problems. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but, yeah. uh, but yeah, that's that I, I assumed that he was in, that he was in that building because he thought that everybody in that building was Hispanic. Mm -hmm. Was it payday? Uh, it, it may have been, it was, it was about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. You'll find that happens a lot. If you, if you, uh, keep an eye on how things 
you know, these robbery things go, you'll find they tend to happen on Friday. They tend to happen a lot of times to Hispanics in areas where there are Hispanic people who have, you know, manual labor jobs. So a lot of Hispanics don't have a legal status. And if you don't have legal status, you can't have a bank. Right. It's a bad deal. It's a real bad deal, especially here in North Carolina. Whereas if you're not an American citizen, even if you're here legally, you can't have a concealed handgun permit in North Carolina. So it makes them even easier targets. That's probably going to change, right? Yeah, it's one of those things. It's, it's actually against the Constitution to pull that stunt, and it's been fought successfully in other states. Well, I mean, it's a big deal if you're an immigrant yeah. and you want to get your carry permit. You can't. That's right. That's a big deal to that person. It sure is. This week, Weird talks about the last segment of the Gun Death Files, suicide. In This, this Week, week in, in Anti-Gun, anti-gun Nuttery. nuttery. Weird. The anti-gunners like to talk about gun deaths. We've talked about homicide and family violence with firearms, but there's still the elephant in the room, suicide. Why do the gun grabbers like to include suicide in their statistics? Well, first up, by adding suicide to violent crime along with a tiny number of accidental firearms deaths, the anti-gunners are able to more than double the total number of gun deaths that they can cite. And uh, since gun death is generally used to compare the United States with other countries who don't allow ordinary citizens to own firearms, Ordinary citizens don't have access to firearms to commit suicide, so they use other methods. Uh, American is in the middle of the road when it comes to suicide, so this is not a guns cause suicide issues. Of the countries listed in the Wikipedia page, list of countries by suicide rate in the U.S. is 35 out of 107, and even that is somewhat dubious since there's a whole bunch of uh, countries at the bottom that have zero suicides listed, and there's all sorts of other different factors such as how it's reported, how suicide is defined, and any other social issues that might surround suicide. Why is it more tragic for somebody to shoot themselves rather than jump off a building or play kiss the train? Doesn't make any difference to me. The second argument that you hear out of gun grabbers is that guns facilitate teen suicide. Yeah, I plugged a little bit of numbers. Using the CDC's uh, Whiskars Fatal Injury Report, Firearm suicides amongst teens is lower than among adults, and the highest age group for firearm suicide in teens is 15 to 19, and it is uh, uh, 42.42%. That means almost 60% of teen suicides uh, between 15 and 19 were without a firearm. The younger ages were even less likely to use firearms. Most suicides are people above middle age. Uh, More than half, 51.75 of all suicides are white males 35 years of age of older. This prints a different picture than an impulsive act and uh, brings a lot more issues into play. So white males 35 years of age or older are more than half of all suicides. That's correct. Oh, that's very interesting. White males 20 plus are 76.7% of all firearm suicides. Teen firearm suicides total 861, or 4.17% of all firearm suicides, 2.12% of all suicides. This is not a significant percentage. To quote from uh, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, in 2012, firearms were most common method of death by suicide, accounting to a little more than half, 50.9%. That means 48.1% of all suicides are being ignored when people are talking about gun death in terms of suicides. By focusing on uh, guns and guns alone, we ignore half of all suicides. This is real blood dancing. They're just, they want to disarm all people and suicide is something that they feel like they can use. And I just don't think it applies. The reality is, is the anti-gunners don't care about suicide. Anti-gunners are generally leftists. They recognize that large numbers of white males over the age of 30 killing themselves are not the people who are going to vote for them anyway. They're simply using these deaths as a way to attack our civil rights. Of course, it would be remiss not to say that if you're considering suicide or know someone is, don't go looking at anti-gun people for help. Call the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Their number is 1-800-273-TALK, which is 8255 for those who don't use alphanumeric keypads. So 1-800-273-8255. That's correct. All right, Weird, it's good to talk to you. See you next week. Talk to you later, Sean. In addition to appearing here, Weird is a regular host at The Squirrel Report and blogs at weirdworld.com. That's W-E-E-R-D world.com. Stuff that grinds my gears.
I think everybody has probably seen this at this point because it, it went all over Facebook. I Yes, I saw it as well. Not even on Facebook. Your sexy stay-at-home knife. <laughs> now, see, I... I thought this was British. I thought this was a guy who was writing in London or something, right? So I just sort of spaced it off. But I kept seeing it and kept seeing it and kept seeing it. I'm like, all right, I'll read it. In this area of search happy security, carrying a knife isn't just an anachronism. It's a terrible idea. So let's retire the term pocket knife along with the practice it implies. Instead, meet the stay-at-home knife, an all-purpose blade for every place but your trousers. Its responsibilities include any task too tough for scissors, but too fine for the rough justice of a utility knife. One rule of thumb, your stay-at-home knife should have at least one purely decorative touch. A non-functional note that says this blade's for unboxing well-packaged wine, not standing your ground. Oh, Jesus. Search happy? Where does this guy live? Does he work in a courthouse or an airport? I originally, like I said, ignored this because I thought it was, you know, it was printed in some British tabloid, right? But it's in a Bloomberg, a U.S.-based newspaper. And he's against pocket knives? The stay-at-home knife? Is he kidding? I've got two whole knife blocks full of stay-at-home knives, plus the three spares that I like best, and they're over on the rolling cart block. Unboxing well-packaged wine? With a knife? Is he a moron? If I ever need to open a case of wine, I'm getting a pair of pliers. My wife has a complete set. And if he means, like, opening the foil on wine, I mean, any knife will do that. And there it is, the old self-defense sneer. Not for standing your ground. Yeah. Yeah, we know where he's going. He's just another grass eater terrified that we regular folks have access to dangerous tools outside of our homes. He'll get along to trying to ban sharp kitchen knives once he's banned my spider code Delica. As Tam says, a man who has a pocket knife isn't armed, he's dressed. What do you got, Adam? Well, right now I have a nice Kershaw Emerson Wave that I just bought for like 30 bucks on Amazon, thanks to Tam. Oh, dude. Oh, it's fantastic. I love it. Yeah, and see, I want a Delica, a Delica Emerson. But they're like $125? No, no, they're about 70 bucks. Um, yeah, I took a look at the, you know, I like the Delica. It's, it's just like, you know, we're going to just be the Tam show here. <laughs> we're like going to quote Tam all the time. But it's like, she's like, it's the go- she's right. It's the Goldilocks knife. It's not too big. It's not too small. You know, and there's there's the the Delica, which is the smaller one, and then they have uh, the Endura, which is slightly mm-hmm. bigger. And I'd like one of each. So if anybody's not doing anything with their money this Christmas, you can totally buy them for me with the wave opening device. Yes, please. yes, the wave <laughs> opening is is pretty neat. Now I will say for those of you who are thinking about buying one of those Kershaw Emersons, because they are you know very inexpensive, they're less than thirty five dollars. Um, there are three different sizes. There's a two and three quarter inch, a three inch and a three and a quarter inch. I got the three and a quarter inch because, you know, bigger is better. Well, Uh uh, when you use the wave opening piece, it actually comes out and it's very, it's kind of awkward in your hand. And so you have to like reposition the grip. So I would probably go with the three inch or the two and a two and three quarter inch. Oh, okay, cool. So just kind of FYI. So Adam, what's grinding your gears today? People who don't love their dogs. Well, screw them. Yeah. So let me tell you what I mean by that. What I mean by that is the folks who just let their dogs just kind of run through the neighborhood, whatever, you know, they're not on leashes. They're not behind fences. They weigh, you know, 12 pounds or, you know, 80 pounds, whatever. These people don't love their dogs. No, they don't. Right. Now, if you're on a farm and you've got, you know, seven acres or 100 acres or whatever, then that's different. But if you're in my neighborhood and you have a quarter acre, Fido needs to be in a fence. Or under your immediate control. Or under your immediate control. Um, Yeah. And, you know, I'm okay if you're walking your dog off leash as long as the dog is very um, obedient. Yeah, we got a dude who does that. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. That is an amazingly well-trained dog. Yes, yes. And I'm okay with that. he's the only one who does that. (laughs) Right, right. Um, So, you know, tactical dog, she's pretty well-trained. I don't let her off leash until we're about a house down from where we live. And she runs along the sidewalk and runs up the, <laughs> up the driveway and then runs up to the front door and sits and waits for me. Uh-huh. There was a guy that I, I used to live by who had three little Yorkies and he would just let them, you know, do whatever. Right. And uh, I, I'm just like, what? how do you not love your dogs? On the tail end of our three mile loop, there's a lady who owns three or four of those little wiener dog things yeah and now they've got two of the cutest i don't know what they are puppies the, you know they're the big lummox big giant paws big oh. floppy ears i mean like 
like kidnap bait right there. <laughs> I mean, it would totally steal these dogs. And she lets them run around the, her house outside, and then the dogs come across the street and attack my dog. Yeah, that's my bad. dog's like a really nice dog, but I think I cured her because one time I just took my dog off the leash and said, "Get him." Yeah, that screaming wiener dog all the way back to the back of the house. Took me like five minutes to get my dog back. (laughs) But it was worth it. That was the last time that dog came off their property. Yeah. You know, I mean, the dog's going to get hit. The dog's going to get in a fight. You know, somebody's going to, around here, somebody's going to shoot it with a pellet gun. Oh. That happens a lot. That terrifies me that somebody, that I might do something stupid and my dog will get run over by a car. Mm -hmm. I mean, that terrifies me. How do you live? Oh, well, you know, whatever. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, I, I don't know. Now, I think you and I may be a little bit different in that our dogs look scary. Well. So, my wife and I have actually talked about it. Tactical dog just wants to lick you, right? True. And if you're 100 yards away, she's going to go full speed right at you to lick you. And that would be terrifying. And that would be absolutely terrifying. Um, And so, you know, if she ever gets away from us and somebody shoots her, we have to be okay with that. Yeah. Right? Because... That's totally what I would do if this dog was running at me full tilt. Yeah. Love your dogs. Don't let them get into a situation where somebody, where they might get hurt somehow. Right. Dogs need rules, boundaries, limitations. And a leash. It does not hurt the dog. It merely shows the dog who he's boss. Right. And if you don't know who I'm talking about, kids, ask your parents. (laughs) Well, that's our show for the week. Thanks again to Rob Allen for our music. And thank you for listening to the Gun Blog Variety Cast. Constructive criticism can be sent to Sean at SeanSorrentino.com and hate mail to WizardPC at GunsCarsTech.com. Show notes can be found at GunBlogVarietyCast.com forward slash episode 17. So where do we want to put it? I think we want to put a tag on that. I don't understand. Or do we want to skip it? Just or is, no, is just, just keep going. Just, just keep good. Going. Just good. You're just dropping it there. Okay. All yeah. right. <clears throat> now let me scroll a little bit while we're in between <laughs> <laughs> and scratch my nose. There we go. I'm pretty. Sean, do you think I'm pretty? Um, I guess so. I don't have a camera to see. <laughs> That's the reason why I don't have a webcam. <laughs> <laughs>